Thank you for this opportunity to ask you a number of questions, uh, relative questions to the uh, very sad uh, jubilee that we are marking this year. Um, July 17th will be the 100th anniversary. That's right. Of the tragedy in Ekaterinburg, the murder of the last Tsar of all Russia, Nicholas II and his family. Uh, the royal family was canonized by the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia in 1981. Yes. And yeah. also canonized by the Russian Church at the beginning of this century. Um, so it's always difficult to talk about them in the sense that uh, they are martyred saints, but at the same time they're historic figures. Yes. And um, like all figures who played a role in history, um, we can discuss their political weaknesses, their strengths, uh, because of the fact that they are historic figures. Um, I've known you for at least 40 years, maybe more. Yes. And uh, I always remember you as a person who had deep respect and veneration. That's right. For the royal family. I would like to find out where this interest, where did you derive this interest? So was it, was it taught to you during childhood? No. Where did it come from? You see, I was born in 1934 in Istanbul. My father came from Anapa, which was um, um, on the Black Sea. South of Russia. South of Russia, and it was a, a place visited by the rich people for their summer holidays. And uh, he came when uh, Dinikin had declared three days of amnesty. So he used those three days to be able to leave Russia and come to Istanbul. It was full of adventures. Well, well he had plenty of money. Your father? Yes. He was a watchmaker, very successful. And uh, so he tried to pay his way out of Russia through some means, like fishermen who would take him from Anapa. This was during the Civil War? Yes. Mm -hmm. To, um, um, what's that uh, port in the uh, south of Russia? Nova... Novorossiysk, Nova yes. Yeah. And from there, he was able to bribe the uh, crew of a ship and they put him behind the boxes. And when the communists came, well, not communists necessarily, at that time it was still Dinikin, they were pushing the swords in between the packages. And he was telling me that he had a hard time avoiding them. So when he would see that sword pass through here, he would know that the next one would be there, so he would be free to move to one side. So um, what is interesting about my father is not like the rest of the immigrants who came to Istanbul, they starved to death because they had none, no occupation, no profession. Most of them were military people. But he found himself a job on the second day of his arrival. Mm. He was a watchman. Watch, uh, repairing watches, and there were only two shops in Istanbul uh, who were engaged in that trade, and so the second day he was already fully employed. My mother came from Sevastopol. Originally she was born in Minsk. Uh, at that time it was part of the Russian Empire. She uh, lost her parents during the evacuation of 1915 when the Russian army was retreating and while the whole family was moving on the road they were attacked by German airplanes so everybody ran in different directions including my mother and after the bombardment she couldn't find her parents for whom she was trying to locate the rest of her life but of course without success. And so both of them came from Russia, but through different routes. 
My mother came from Sevastopol and she went through Romania, Bulgaria. Finally, she came to Istanbul. It was called Constantinople then. And this is where my parents met. And the result was myself and my sister, who is older than I. If it wasn't for revolution, I wouldn't be around. Well. <laughs> so maybe I should say thank you to well. revolution well. from that point of view. On a personal level. I, yeah, well. um, my father had a very clear understanding of the revolution. He used to say that they took over the power but couldn't hold it in their hands, especially about Kerensky. And he blamed all these people for upsetting the apple cart, for destroying so many Russians. Millions of Russians were killed as a result of this uprising of the aristocracy on, in February, end of February, beginning of March 1917. Now, of course, there was veneration for Tsar's family, but uh, that's really where it all ended. And myself, including, of course, I love the Tsar's family, but my true, true preoccupation with the Tsar's family started in 1969, when I had a um, um, scholarship to study in, in Paris. I came from Montreal to study there for nine months, a pre-stress concrete. And then there was nothing much to do in the evening as I didn't have any friends or acquaintances. But then I found, found the library of Turgenev, where I went. And I don't think it was coincidence, it was God's will. Because which book do you think I found when I went there? The um, diaries in Russian? Yes. Oh. Oh, uh, the, not uh, exactly the diaries, well, but the letters. The um, assassination report by... Oh, Dietrich. No. Uh, Sokolov. Sokolov. Mm -hmm. Sokolov. I didn't know much about those details. I took it out, the book, and I was so fascinated by it mm -hmm. that I spent the whole day and the next day I didn't even go to the course reading the book. And then since then, I was totally preoccupied with this subject. Today, there doesn't pass a day when I am not doing something about learning more about the Tsar and the family. Uh, so my vision, of course, completely changed. I found the truth. Uh, I regret that many Russians now talk only about October Revolution. They should be talking about February Revolution, not October Revolution. And they should also accept the fact that their parents and grandparents were instrumental in organizing this revolution. So that's why the whole Russian immigration should repent. Yes, um, repent, repent, what happened. especially aristocracy. Mm -hmm. And there is an interesting incident that I sometimes like to tell people. In December of 1916, that's the year when Rasputin was murdered, just before New Year. I think, no, on the 17th of December. <clears throat> the Tsar went to see his wife, who was spending time with Buxgavidin. Uh, she was the lady in waiting. And he said to them, I don't understand. It's not clear to me why Alexeyev is insisting that I should no, Alexeyev urgently. Is the general. Alexeyev is the general mm -hmm. who, who was directly responsible to the Tsar, because the Tsar since 1915 became the uh, the commander-in-chief commander mm -hmm. of the Russian army, replacing Kalai Nikolaevich, uh, the great count. I can't understand, he said, why Alexeyev insisting that I should be urgently going to the Stavka, to the Stav headquarters. Stavka's headquarters, yeah. yes. Mm -hmm. And then he left on the 22nd of February, and the revolution started on the 23rd. This is not possible to believe that nobody knew anything about the revolution, that it was coincidental, that uh, nobody, nobody really helped. There was, it was organized, it was crafted.
to the last detail. And I'm sorry to say, my wife is also against it, but the whole organizational aspect of the Russian Revolution is the responsibility of Masons, 100%. And I say this without hesitation, because I know it. Because the first government, uh, uh, the, the, the government that was established by Lvov, he was the chief. Um, 33. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then every member, every member of the provisional government was a Mason. Mm -hmm. And the idea there was to destroy Russia, and they did it with great success. This is why, after that, it was not important that the provisional government should succeed, because the main task was to destroy Russia. That was done. The rest is not well, interesting to the anybody. The Bolsheviks went ahead and destroyed the Masons, too. Um, the Bolsheviks had this ideology of communism, international communism, which was not workable obviously, but uh, the result was that millions of Russians lost their lives, a lot of them. Not only Russians, a lot of other I had a, I had a, I remember a teacher, uh, his name was uh, Platon Viktorovich, he was a fantastic teacher, math was his main subject, and he pulled me through in the university when I was going to American University to, be, to study engineering, he helped me a lot. Now, a man like him had not been the Russian Revolution, would have been a very, very famous scholar in the Russian Empire. He had a hard time earning enough money to support himself. Mm. Yeah. So, um, and then a few points, maybe, if you don't mind, about General Alexeyev. Um, the Tsar loved him and trusted him like nobody else. And when he was sick, Tsar sent him to Sevastopol for a whole month. To Crimea. Yeah, so for recuperation. And there, a group of liberals came to see Alexeyev and asked him if he would help to organize revolution. Now, Alexeyev's answer was, it's baffling, it's unbelievable that, you know, somebody who swore allegiance to the Tsar could have given such a reply. He said, help I won't, but I won't interfere. Mm. A similar <clears throat> story can also be said about Nikolai Nikolaevich. Um, the uncle. The um, uncle, yes, the... the great uncle. Well, both him and his father were really useless. Both of them happened to be commanders-in-chief uh, of the Russian army, but that was a great, great historical mistake in both times. Uh, the first one was against Turkey, uh, Ottoman Empire, during the reign of uh, Alexander II. Um, Alexander II uh, nominated his brother Nikolai, Nikolai, the senior, to be the chief of the army. And there at Plevna, he was totally unsuccessful because of his inability to lead the Russian army. And it was uh, thanks to this young um, general, whose name I can't now recall, that conquered Plevna. And then after that, it was a steamroller until Constantinople. Uh, yes, so the son, Nicolas, Nikolai Nikolaevich, he was approached by the same group of liberals, asking him whether he would like to become Nicholas III. I mean, what a fantastic idea. So appealing, so wonderful. And uh, Tsaritsa Alexander used to caution her husband that there is such a, right. in, an interest mm -hmm. in Nikolai Nikolaevich. So the group came, offered him to help, and he, instead of hanging all of these people as he should, because they were traitors, said, give me three days to think about it. 
And then at the end of the third day, he said, I decided not to take that step because the army probably wouldn't understand it or appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine the, mo mo the moral, the point of view, the allegiance and all this is, is not considered at all in his answer, mm -hmm. but uh, his own personal interest. Interesting. <clears throat> um, over 30 years ago, the remains of the royal family were found. Yes. Um, near the place where, well, they were, they were shot. Yes. Um, there's been controversy about the remains. Yes. Uh, have you ever had any doubt that these are the remains of the royal family? Well, you see, through you, Father, I was able to make acquaintance with um, Avdonin. Because mm -hmm. he came here to our church. He gave a very interesting des description of his work. And of course, I was yearning and willing to do anything just to go to Ekaterinburg. And so I spoke to Avdonin and he invited me to come to, mm -hmm. to see him. And as a result of this, I was able to not only touch, but to pray to the remains of the royal family, which then were in the museum. Um, well, I, mm -hmm. well, the first one was conducted by the Brits. The DNA uh, test. DNA. Mm -hmm. And there was really no reason to doubt. And the coincidence was 99.9%. Mm -hmm. 1% was left for some reason. And then when his brother, the Tsar's brother's uh, mm -hmm. remains were extracted to study DNA, interestingly enough, his results were also 99.9%. Now started the intrigues, especially among the Russian colony abroad, in New York especially, who started to seed some doubts among people. Why is that? Why do you think they doubted? Why couldn't they say, just admit the scientific evidence? Because there was a group of people who wanted to put some doubts in people's mind. And this group... But for what reason? Just to make themselves famous? No. Uh, unfortunately, there is a group of people who to this day hate the Tsar with intensity that you can't believe. And uh, so unfortunately, there are such people who try to create some confusion uh, and the truth is being questioned, even by our church. And uh, this, I think this is unfortunate. Well, this year, of course, uh, you know, the church uh, organized its own investigation yes. of the uh, remains of the royal family. And uh, uh, there was a big roundtable discussion. The patriarch took part at, at the Satinsky Seminary in, yes. in Moscow. And it seemed to me, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed to me that they are on the road to uh, to uh, admit that the uh, remains are the, of the royal family. Do you think it will happen soon? Well, in my simpli simplistic mind, because when it comes to religion, I can only pray to God. Uh, I'm not really an authority to, to talk about it. But the church demanded that whoever gets into contact with the remains, with the relics, there should be at least one um, miracle taking place. And so far, from what I understand, no miracles took place. Well, as far as I understand, uh, miracles from martyred saints are not necessary. They are saints because they give up their life for a higher cause. Uh, you know, it's so one thing when you have a, a monastic saint, like Saint Seraphim of Sarov, yeah. that's one miracle they're expected. But when, when martyrs, I mean, we canonize martyrs because they gave up their lives for Christ. Yes. The miracles aren't expected. Anyway, that's... Uh, no, that's what I heard, that the uh, yeah, well, Russian Orthodox Church was hoping that a miracle would take well, place, I, I, which would be I can the tell last... You, 
I can tell you that when I received the remains of the royal family here in Washington, uh, they were taken to the U.S. Army. Yes, I know. I, I went there yeah. with Abdonian. And uh, there was a series of uh, relics that were given to me, uh, and they were under scotch tape on cardboard. Yes. I put them on the altar yes. table, and then when I remo removed the scotch tape very carefully, because I had to divide this little piece yeah. to send it to another parish. Right. When I took the scotch tape yes. off, yes. I could smell the roses. I mean, it, the, the, fr the remains were fragrant. Yes, I believe you, not that I ever doubt you, but there was a historian by the name Lyons, I don't know if he ever yes, heard of him. Yes, of course. Mm -hmm. And I had the pleasure of visiting him in Vancouver, and he had the hair of the um, Tsar Nicholas II when he was a small child. And uh, for some reason somebody gave him the hair that was cut off from his head when he was a kid. And when he opened that package, it was absolutely incredible, the smell that came out of this hair. Mm -hmm. yeah. Evgeny, um, a few weeks ago, or actually a month ago, yes. uh, Holy Trinity Publications yes. uh, published in English for the first yes. time the diaries of uh, Father Bilyaev, who was the last priest at the, at the um, Alexander, of, uh, Alexander Palace who ministered to the royal family before they were exiled to Tobolsk. Right. Now I understand this manuscript was brought out of Russia by you. Yes. Could you I'm... tell us a little bit how this happened? What, when, how many years ago? Uh, it is a story that I would prefer not to talk about. Oh. Because uh, it's not going to take us anywhere, really. Um, it's confusing. Um, but you did bring the manuscript out to the West, and it was published in Russian. Yes, I. well, it's not only in Russian, it was also published in English. Mm -hmm. And you wrote then the um, introduction. Yes, yes, but... It, it came out already in, uh, in Jordan, the, the Holy Trinity Monastery. In magazine format. Yeah, in the magazine. But now it's a book. No, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's a well-known Russian uh, biographer of Nicholas II in Russia. Yes. Uh, Bakhanov, Alexander yes. Bakhanov. You're holding his book. Yes. Uh, he's he's a prolific writer. He's written a whole series of books. Forty. Um, 40 books. 40 together. books, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and 3,200 3, articles. Yeah, and this, is, this book uh, I found extremely readable. Yes. It's, uh, it's not for academics, it's no. for, you know, all people. Yes. Uh, you know, and um, he's, he's a fantastic writer. Yes. Uh, and you, you know him personally, he's been yes. here. He's yes, been here. I met him in Garf mm -hmm. when I was in Moscow. At that time, it was the first time that the DNA was being studied, and I had a few friends. Uh, I was accepted to go to Garf. With Garf is the government archives, yes, of Russia. Of Russia, yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a I had a permit to go whenever I wanted to, which was very convenient. And there was a special room where scholars were allowed to do their investigation where I was also allowed to go. And so one day when I was telling about the results of the first DNA, a man walks in and he says, oh, that's very interesting. And I said, and who are you? And he says, I'm Bakhanov. <laughs> I had read his book. I had spoken to his father, what a fantastic son he had to write such a wonderful book. And so we embraced each other. And this is how we met actually mm -hmm. for the first time. And then we invited him, as you know, to yeah. give a lecture on Stalupin. Uh, he had uh, access to the archive, to the archives, even those that were officially closed, forbidden to everybody. Miranyanka allowed him. He had no no restrictions. Yeah, Miranyanka was the chief archivist. Yes, he was uh, Sergei Miranyanka. He was the director of the archives. 
And on that basis, of course, he wrote a book which is absolutely fantastic. It's based on facts, not on rumors or hearsay, as most of the books are written about Nicholas II, or uh, an interesting also imagination. And we're trying to get it now published by uh, Holy Trinity, and they're investigating it. And so if you can put a kind word for on your part to enhance this hope, we'll be very grateful. Mm -hmm. But interesting enough about Bakhanov, like every Soviet citizen, he was born a communist, and he believed in that theory. And he wrote his dissertation also about uh, the uh, rich newspapers in Russia and the capital. Then after he met Miranenka, and after he had studied all these very, very interesting documents, he told me that I looked at the photographs of the imperial family and I couldn't believe against what they were telling us that the Tsar was bloodthirsty. He would kill anybody who opposed him. And at that time, of course, he believed the story, but then when he looked at the photographs of the royal family, he said, I was sure they were not capable to do anything. So this is the first time a doubt came to his mind. And as he read more, and as he studied more documents about uh, Tsar Nicholas II, he, who was a communist, became a monarchist. And he is definitely a monarchist today. Unfortunately, he had a stroke recently, which incapacitated him. But um, the book that he wrote is a treasure. It's not appreciated because it doesn't have any intrigues or dirty stories in it. It's all factual. And uh, sometimes these books are not popular, as you know yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a copy of this book yes. in, our, in our library, parish library, and I hope that our parishioners will avail themselves of, of this book, and uh, especially, particularly this year, when we celebrate the, uh, well, celebrate, we uh, mark the 100th anniversary of the tragic uh, murder of Nicholas II and his uh, family. There is uh, one interesting thing, I don't know, I think you are also involved to a certain extent with Rasputin because the last comment I heard from you convinced me about it. Where you said had uh, Rasputin had access to, to the Tsar before declaration of First World War, it might not have happened. And it's true. It's a fact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was, a, but big, what that was is, a big mistake. Oh yes, a ca capital mistake. Yeah. And um, what is interesting, the number seven is a number which is not favorable for the royal family, for the Tsar's family. Interesting also that Rasputin was also killed on the 17th. Tsar's family was killed on the 17th. A lot of terrible things happened to the family. Seven or 17 was always something that figures out there. Interesting. Do you think the attitude of the Russian people in Russia is changing towards the royal family? Are people indifferent, or is there a growing interest in, in uh, what he stands for, his legacy? I, um, I'm not sure, because a hundred years passed, life was completely different then. For the young people to appreciate that life is very, very difficult, because we live different life now. Um, the, 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 the understanding of the Tsar being weak, although golden-hearted, still prevails. And to a certain extent, it's true. Because had it been Peter I, I don't think any revolution would have taken place. No. Uh, he was a very kind man. He tried to help whoever he could. There was a lot of progress made in Russia because of his donations to different organizations which today is not really appreciated. The home of the people, which was so popular during the communists, actually was started during Nicholas II, mm. through his donations. Um, he is a historical figure that had been 
misunderstood completely by everybody, mm -hmm. without exception. And to change this uh, will take time, and I don't think people would really spend their time on him. There would probably be more interesting and attractive subjects to occupy themselves. Well, sure, but you know, the family has been canonized by the Russian church as a whole, and uh, millions are expected to visit Ekaterinburg on July 7th. And uh, so I personally think that the, the, the uh, popularity of Nicholas II is growing. And I think people will, will study, learn, read more and more books like Bakhanov's about Nicholas II and uh, um, hopefully learn the truth. Because isn't it the truth will set you free? Yes, but then what is truth? It's also all relative oh. to the certain people who are trying to talk about truth. It's always modified, you know, in their way. Okay, but we hope that and, uh, uh, the fact that the church is canonized and the church is the keeper of the truth, the Christ truth. Yes. So, in any case, uh, Evgeny, thank you very much. I hope I contributed something con useful. Conversation. I and, uh, I'm sure you did. A day doesn't pass without me studying something about uh, his, his family. And one thing that I just wanted to, as a closing uh, sentence maybe, a lot of times I see that the Tsar's family was executed by a firing squad. And this concept of execution is totally wrong. And they were slaughtered. They were, they were murdered, mm -hmm. of course. And, but nonetheless, very prominent writers still use this expression of mm -hmm. execution. Yeah. This, is, this is unbelievable and very wrong, of course. Yeah. Yeah, of course, I agree, totally. Yeah, thank you for giving me well, this opportunity. Yeah, I probably it. didn't say half of what I wanted to well. say. But, you know, to be continued. All okay. Right. Yes, that's nice. maybe maybe after July 17th. Are you going there? No, no. I was lucky to, to have gone there twice. The church wasn't still built mm -hmm. on the on the Ipatsev's um, house that was destroyed by Yeltsin, and uh, in the, uh, in the what is it called the uh, Yama uh, Ganyana Yama. Oh. The, around it, they build all these churches, mm -hmm. and Abdonian always said that this is not the place yeah, yeah. where the remains were found. Nonetheless, it's been developed, and I think everybody now is talking about Ganyanayama, Ganyanayama, yeah, yeah. which is a long but it's location. Uh, what logo? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, we'll we'll go, but I think at a different time when there are okay. many yes. many people there. Like it'll be in this year. In July 17th. Yes. Again, thank you very much. Thank you very much.